It was a day of mixed feelings as the National Assembly today voted on the relevant clauses up for amendment in the ongoing constitution amendment exercise. Over 60 clauses were put up for the voting, for some of which include issues relating to autonomy for local government administration, administration of the judiciary in Nigeria, and several other critical portions. But sadly, all the women-related bills failed to sail through. Before the voting began, President Buhari's letter to the National Assembly was read where he was seeking the amendment of the Section 84 sub 12 of the Electoral Act, which he raised alarm over, or which he spoke about after he signed the bill into law last week, Friday. With today's voting and all of this process done today, there are just about three more stages to conclude the process of amending the Constitution, which will make perhaps the fifth alterations, if my calculations is right, to the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended. Well, let's take a look at uh, perhaps some of the list and some of the issues that were voted today, some of which include um, the autonomy for uh, issues of financial autonomy for local government, devolution of powers, affirmative action for women in political party administration, restriction of formation of political parties, inclusion of judges of the National Industrial Court in the composition of election tribunal, expansion of the scope of executive immunity, time frame for the submission of the names of ministerial or commissioner uh, nominees, establishment of a state security council, uh, power to summon the president and governors, traditional rulers and institutions and their roles in governance, reserve quota for women, creation of the office of the accountant general of the federal government, time frame for the conduct of population census. There are a whole lot of uh, these clauses that are being looked into today. Um, well, eminent Nigerians have clamor for restructuring of the country and question the state of our federalism. Well, in all of what has happened today, you'll be asking a big question. A lot of people have criticized the state of our constitution, whether or not it's the kind of constitution that we need, the structuring, whether or not it's the way to go. Our federalism is it the best one that we should be operating. So many questions on constitutionalism and the issue of our federalism. Let's get a sense of this amendment process and the implications for Nigeria. I'm being joined tonight by a renowned Nigerian constitutional lawyer, Senior advocate of Nigeria is the author of uh, modern 10 books, law books, which has become some of the greatest resource materials for law students in Nigeria. One of his so popular uh, uh, law of contract book by Saige, a foremost law teacher who was appointed by President Muhammad Buhari as a chairman of Presidential Advisory Committee Against Corruption, Professor Isha Sage, he joins us from Lagos. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us tonight. How does it come to you? Because I know you have, you're have one of those who have uh, argued and debated um, extensively on the state of our uh, constitution and the state of, of our federalism. Give us a sense tonight of what you make of the process of amending the constitution. Yes, uh, first I must say I'm not a constitutional lawyer by training. We all became constitutional lawyers by necessity. So, so I, don't, I don't want to give myself that title. Now, coming up to what's happening, I have I've gone through uh, most of the items which the National Assembly has taken up. And um, unfortunately, it has conformed with what I've always felt about the uh, modifications of the, of the Constitution. They are totally irrelevant to our needs at the moment. What we want, what is necessary, what is causing a lot of problems in the country is a question of restructuring the question of having a true federalism. They've not they've not they've not touched that at all. We, we should be if I may give an example of what I'm talking about, we, we should be talking of funding funding formula for the federation. 
there should be no federation account. We should retain the provisions of the 1963 Constitution on, under which each region and now state retains 50% of its resources, sends 20% to the federal government, and sends 30% to a distributable pool to be distributed amongst the members of the, the states of the Federation in, in accordance with the, your level of um, sufficiency in terms of provisions. So under the distributable pool, the, the least able states, the poorest states, get more from that pool, but every state, even the rich ones, also get some. So that, that is one. And under that formula, that 50 for the, for the state, 20 for the federal government, 30 for the, uh, to the distributable pool. Then, then I noticed a lot of attention was spent on issues that are totally irrelevant with regard to local government. We should not be talking of local government at all in the Constitution. They, what they should discuss is total removal of the provisions of local government from the Constitution. The, the, the Constitution should not tell us what we should do about our local government. It should not contain a list of our local governments. The lo local government is a state matter. Completely, 100% state matter. Has nothing to do with the federal government. Nothing to do with it. So when you talk of local government, funding of local government, how to create a special account for local government separate from state government, they're all irrelevant. Because it shouldn't be in the Constitution at all. The state, there are only two members in a federation, two, fe two federation units in a federation, federal state, federal state. Local government does not come in. The local government is a creature of the state. It belongs to the state 100%. Federal government and the constitution have nothing to do with it. So, it is for the state to determine how many local governments it wants, what is the type of local government it wants. It, 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 may, it may decide that there will be no democratic local governments. Rather, they propose civil servants, civil servants to administer local governments. We have that under the colonial government. We have this district officers running local government. So the, the state has nothing to do with it. The federal government has nothing to do with it. It shouldn't be the Constitution. That's, that's a state matter. So the, the state determines how many local governments it wants, where they are to be located, and most importantly, will be totally and fully responsible for, for, for funding it. It is it's not, the, it's not the duty of, uh, of, of, of the federation to be funding local governments. There sh so the question of creating special account for it should not arise. It, there should be no account for local government. There should be no federating account. There should be budget of federal government separate, budget of states separate, and, and the state should now create its own account for its own local governments. The same thing with the police force. Well, uh, that's what I expected the, yeah. this constitutional uh, review to one talk of the about. Things that you are saying now, uh, align like sta some kind of state governments to have the police. From, what in the, from the position of the 1999 constitution, yeah. uh, section 7 uh, stresses yes. and talked about uh, the structure of local government and its administration. And if going by what you have explained tonight, in the kind of a structure of federalism that we need to operate, uh, that would be a very radical move. But for you tonight, Prof, what can you tell us that is uh, 
uh, I'm looking at the agitation for restructuring. Whether or not what the lawmakers today did uh, served to an extent the, those agitations of those who are seeking or asking for restructuring. Did it in any way touch on it? Did it in any way serve those agitation? Well, from what I've heard, so far, nothing on restructuring has been touched. I, 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 would, I would suggest to you that you should list, list those items to me. And then maybe I'm overlooking something and I will, I will uh, ex express my views. Take up uh, the issue of the devolution of powers, for example. Um, they, they, they touched on devolution of power. They touched, I mean, local government, you've sufficiently spoken about financial autonomy for local government. You have the view that local yeah. government should not even reflect yeah. in the structure of our federal, of, uh, federal state operations. Uh, they talked about the restriction of formation of yeah. political parties, um, the issues of immunity. Uh, they talked also about the establishment of state security council. That is a very big one. They also talked about the power to summon the president and the governors. And uh, in the structure of the country also, the role of the traditional rulers, whom are now going to be advi ad uh, advisors to the state or the federal government in their own, uh, in their own uh, respect. So um, how do you re react to some of these areas? Well, I mean, some of them are neither here nor there. The, the, role, the role of the traditional rulers, for example, if they are not elected, what, what sort of powers could be given to them that are enforceable at law? So that is an issue that has to be, that, that arises. I, I don't want a situation in which we put various uh, uh, actors in the, in the Constitution and then not give them power or a role. So I don't, I, we, we have to be careful to avoid merely listing the traditional rulers without giving them an effective role. Yeah. Please, can I have, what, the, what are the One of the areas that I did not go through is um, the pensions for some uh, uh, National Assembly uh, mem uh, members, the uh, presiding officers of the National Assembly, that, that they, did, they couldn't, that failed. How do you react to that? I think quite rightly it should fail. And I'm, I'm glad it failed. We are still angry about governors who have this humongous pension arrangements uh, which give them resources and funds that are, that are simply beyond belief. While we are still trying to cope with that, some people want to allow the heads of the legislative houses to, to come into that, uh, to, to enjoy the same sort of resources from uh, forces. So I think it's a very good, uh, that's a good decision of the National Assembly today. And uh, hopefully, the same thing will happen to the governors uh, through resolutions of the various houses of assembly. Yeah, that uh, is of uh, interest is uh, they passed the, the power to empower National Assembly and the state assemblies to summon the president or governors in the areas of security. When there are security concerns, they pass that, uh, that the clause to the power of the, the, uh, the parliament or the, the legislative arm of government to summon the president, as the case may be, for the National Assembly, and the governors, as the case may be, for the state houses of assembly. How does that sound to you? I don't, li I don't like that language, to summon. You don't, you don't summon your head of state. The head of state is the number one citizen of this country. He is a representative at the, at, the, at the international level. And he has to be respected. You can't summon him. I, I, I think these are houses of assembly, of national assembly, you should be very careful 
of the sort of mentality they have and the sort of language they use. If they say invite, you can invite, and you don't need to make it compulsory. A, a head of state who is in tune with the, with the way the country is being run and has an interest in the way matters uh, in the way this country should be governed will respond positively to the genuine invitation by any assembly, whether national or state. But to say you want to have power to summon, so you want to turn the head of state into your subordinate, that is a sort of mentality that I detest, and I don't, I, I don't agree with that. About uh, um, the clause that uh, relates to the state of the nation and state of the state address. State of the state address in the state, state of the nation address for the, uh, for the federal. I think that went, uh, that, that sailed through. Oh, that is that. There should be a state of nation address or state of state address. Yes, I think it's, it's, it's a good idea. And, uh, that will give the chief executive at both federal and state level the opportunity of of uh, explaining what they had done during their tenure, what they plan to do, and to use that opportunity to invite both the legislatures and even the ordinary citizen to cooperate with them in achieving these uh, state objectives. I think, I think that's a positive decision. But, Prof, uh, I mean, <laughs> this is uh, perhaps not uh, a good one for women uh, or women folk who looked towards uh, about almost six or five bills or more uh, women bill today failed. Both on the, uh, on both, one went through at um, the Senate, uh, but the, all of the bills in the National Assembly relating to women and the rights of women, issue of citizenship, uh, uh, issue of indigenous women, and all a lot of those issues that are related to women fail today. Uh, what is happening? Uh, is, it, is, that, is it that our laws are becoming patriarchal by the day that we have a system that doesn't really like women, or what is happening? Yes, we, we, we have seen that giving a level playing field uh, women still cannot compete with our men for political positions for all reasons. The, some of the reasons I hear is that meetings are held at night and the women cannot attend such meetings, which is fair enough. But I think, I think what the National Assembly should have done would have been to make provision for a certain percentage of seats for women in the, in the legislatures. And, uh, and so that whether they, they contest with men or not, they will be guaranteed that minimum number of seats. So to that extent, I think the House that rejected the bill was wrong. But again, I don't, I don't know how many seats they were trying to create. Maybe somebody, maybe somebody proposed too many seats. If, if the this, seats this are too many, that, that could be a discouraging uh, factor. But otherwise, the principle is good. But our women should be guaranteed a minimum number of seats. Mm. Uh, there's one area, Prof, that I know is probably going to be of interest. One of the bills that passed, uh, that, that, that went through today, is uh, they approved the bill including presiding officers in the National Assembly uh, on the membership of the National Security Council. And it does look like um, the National Assembly has also criminalized or made an offense if you are summoned uh, before or make a possible conviction of any person who refuses to honor the summon of the National Assembly or any of its committees. Okay, I think the, the, the first provision is quite a, quite a positive provision. That is that the heads of the uh, legislative houses should be members of the Security Council, both federal and state. I think it's a good idea because uh, if, you, if you would note that the, 
the president of Isenia, for example, is the number three citizen of this country. And the, the speaker of the house is number, is number four. So, so if the chief justice is going to be there, why shouldn't the two of them be there? So to that extent, I, I, support, I support that provision. Um, what, what was the second provision issue you raised? Penalize or make an offense. Uh, anybody that is summoned by the National Assembly and fail okay. to, to show up in any of its committees, uh, they, they pass the bill to make such an, uh, an action an offense. No, I think that, that is definitely reprehensible. It will be abused. And what, what I have noticed is that the National Assembly particularly not only wants to be a law-making body, they want to be a judicial body too, because this is judicial powers they are trying to wield. And they also want to be a, um, an executive body, because they will pass resolutions and expect it to be binding, whereas it's merely, merely suggestive to, to, the, to the executive just merely recommendatory to the executive, but they, they want it to bind. So they want to make executive, they want to take executive decisions that are binding. Now they want to be members of the judiciary by having people arrested and tried by simply, simply by the fact that such people did not uh, appear when they were invited. And it could be that at the time they are invited, the time the period was not convenient for them. Maybe they had some more important national assignments. And my, my, my experience is that the National Assembly has never been satisfied with, with explanations. No, that power will be abused. And it is the judicial power. So I, I, I'm against it. Prof, we need to take a break. But when we come back, I'll need your help to clarify in your uh, closing moments with us tonight uh, whether or not there is a constitutional conflict with the Electoral Act on the Section 84, Subsection 12, which the President raised. Uh, he wrote back to the National Assembly for them to amend it. Whether or not uh, any sitting political appointee of government who is willing to run for office should resign, whether that is in a conflict or their human right or their right of franchise, you, we would like you to um, clarify that for us as you close with you, Prof. Stay with us, Professor Sage. We're back in a moment. And again, after when we come, I mean, when we come back, I'll be having a former federal lawmaker, Senator Ayo Arishi and Cynthia Imbamalu, a woman rights advocate and a lawyer who will talk more on the issues raised in today's proceeding of the National Assembly. Both of them will be breaking it down further for us tonight. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. Our closing moments now with Professor Isha Sage, a renowned uh, law teacher in Nigeria and senior advocate of Nigeria. Thank you so much, Professor Sage, for your time tonight. Um, my final question to you tonight will be on uh, the concern of President Buhari on Electoral Act 2022 and is written to the, to the National Assembly asking them to look into it. There's been debate on whether or not there is a clash or whether or not that provision is ultra -vires. What's your view? Well, I, I want to start by saying that the National Assembly has a big problem. That is that whatever they do, they must provide something for themselves. They, would, they, they don't have the culture of passing a law for the sake of that law and for the sake of the people, but they must also insert something in everything they are doing for themselves. And that is what is causing all this confusion. First, we had the electoral bill, which was supposed to go to the president for signature. They added direct primaries for themselves. Direct primaries for themselves how to give them advantage over governors and so on. Personal, they put it there. 
the president objected to it. He said, please remove it and send it back without direct primaries provision, and I will sign. What did they do? They went back to the old habit again. They now brought in a new provision which will make it, uh, uh, comp uh, uh, which will compel government appointees in, in the executive to resign before they contest the election. Again, for themselves, so that they can increase their own chances of success in an election at the expense of such appointees. Another, so that is why the president again hesitated in signing it. And, and I think he was very generous to have signed that bill. If I, if I were the president, I would not sign it. I would send it back to them to remove that section, making it compulsory for, uh, for um, appointees in government to resign. Because that was not in the, in the, in the, in the bill. It was just done for their own self-interest. Now, on the issue of the Constitution, the Constitution already has provision on that, in that respect. That is 30 days. The Constitution provides 30 days for those who are appointed in government to resign if they are contesting an election. And, and the law is very clear. Once the Constitution has made a provision, any other provision is, is illegal and, un, and unenforceable. We have a series of Supreme Court cases on this point. You cannot add to, you cannot improve, you cannot reduce from anything that has been put in the Constitution. It must be applied exactly as it is, it is, it is uh, stated in the Constitution. What they are trying to do is an amendment of the Constitution by normal bill. And that is illegal. The, the electoral bill was a normal bill. It was not a constitutional review bill. So to introduce a provision which changes the Constitution, which it has done, is illegal. So frankly, whether, whether they go back to change it or not, if I'm a contestant in government, if I'm an appointee, I will resign 30 days to an election. I go and contest that election. And I will see anybody trying to challenge me because of an illegal provision that it quietly slipped into the electoral bill. So, in my view, they have a moral duty to remove that right. provision. And if they don't remove it, let all those affected by it go on and carry on their election uh, right, their, their, their election rights in accordance with the Constitution, not, not in accordance with an illegal provision in the, in the electoral bill. So that, that's my view. Professor S. S. Sage, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure having you uh, speak to us on the position of law and the very important uh, uh, state of the nation matters like this. Thank you so much, uh, Prof, for joining us tonight. I appreciate the time. Thank you.